of up to four years. Order, Senator Rustin. You'll be in continuation. Um, we'll debate resumes. Questions without notice. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, Mr Morrison finally apologised to victims of his illegal robo-debt scheme. What lessons has he learned? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's very clear, uh, consistent with uh, the positions of governments of both political persuasions, uh, that um, it is entirely appropriate for overpayment that have been made to be, to be recovered. But of course that needs to be done and must be done and the government would always intend it to be done uh, in a way uh, that is uh, lawful. And um, so uh, you know, in, in those circumstances it was appropriate for the Prime Minister to make the statement uh, he did uh, to the House yesterday. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Two weeks ago on Insiders, the Attorney General refused to apologise to victims of the illegal robo-debt scheme. This week, this minister refused nine opportunities to apologise. When did this minister first become aware of Mr Morrison's intention to apologise and what changed? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, President. It's a matter of physical fact that I uh, obviously only become aware of answers that are provided in the other place um, after they've been provided. So um, clearly the Prime Minister might uh, provided an answer yesterday to a question that was asked and that is entirely appropriate. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Can Mr Morrison guarantee that he won't seek to reboot a rebadged robo-debt scheme to target vulnerable people in the middle of Australia's first recession in 29 years? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, um, what the government uh, can guarantee is that we will continue to ensure that if people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money, as said, as said by Tanya Plibersek. And of course, we know that Mr. Shorten, uh, Mr. Shorten supported the automation of this process, and we know that, and we know that Chris Bowen also supported uh, that principle. I mean, I, I guess, I guess what, what we're hearing here is the Labour Party is essentially suggesting that when people are paid, Order. When, when, when payments are made to people in excess of what they should Order. have been, the, the Labour Party is essentially saying that the government should just walk away and leave it. We should just Order make overpayment after left. overpayment and not seek to. If that is the position of the Labour Party, the Labour Party should spell it out. Order. When I call senators to order, the informal rule is they must count to ten before they start in inappropriately interjecting again. Senator Davey. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. How is the Liberal and Nationals government driving economic recovery in our drought-affected regions by supporting the rebuilding of their businesses, their job markets? and their confidence following the triple shock of bushfires, drought and the economic impacts of the COVID virus. The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Day for her question um, and acknowledge all of us on the government side of the chamber our commitment to rural and regional Australia and, of course, Australians uh, who live there. Uh, Mr President, as we know, rural and regional Australians are incredibly resilient. This has been highlighted in particular because of the incidents of the recent droughts, the bushfires, the floods and, of course, the impact of COVID-19. But as we have all witnessed, rural and regional Australians, they have come through these significant challenges because of their fighting spirit. And it is a fighting spirit that Senator Davey would know cannot be underestimated. Mr President, the Liberal and National Governments, we are proud to support rural and regional Australians. Why? Because it's in our DNA. Last week, the government announced that drought-affected communities across Australia will benefit from 163 local infrastructure and community building projects as part of a $207 million investment under Round 4 of the Australian Government's Building Better Regions Fund. Mr President, this fund provides grants of up to $10 million to local governments or incorporated not-for-profit organisations for infrastructure and community initiatives. The fund invests in community projects that create jobs, drive economic growth 
and build stronger regional and uh, rural communities into the future. Mr. President, the most recent round of the Building Better Regions Fund specifically focuses on helping communities that have been hardest hit by the crippling droughts. We know that many regional communities continue to face the effects of the prolonged dry spell. Our, our message as a government to them is clear. We understand that you are suffering and we understand the challenges that you are facing. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Yes. Is the minister aware of any specific examples of the types of projects and jobs the Building Better Regions Fund supports? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And yes, I am. The government is continuing its long-standing, as I said, commitment to rural and regional Australia by making vital local projects a reality. And these vital local projects, what do they do? They create more jobs and they drive economic development across our regional and rural communities. Mr. President, we have seen very, very good outcomes from the first three rounds of the Building Better Regions Fund, and we now want to build on these outcomes, including infrastructure projects that we are funding, the Tenterfield Water Treatment Plant Replacement Project in New South Wales, the construction of disability respite care units, so important for people in need of that respite care, in Gundawini in Queensland, and in my home state of Western Australia in Ravensthorpe, the construction of a multi-purpose centre and interactive cultural precedent. Again, job-creating projects to help these communities. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And what additional support is the Liberal and Nationals government providing to our regions who have been affected by COVID-19 and the bushfires? Senator Cash. Well, again, Mr. President, as I've said, the Liberal National Government supporting rural and regional Australians, it is in our DNA. And you'd be aware that as part of our economic recovery package for COVID-19, we have established a $1 billion COVID-19 relief and recovery fund to support regions, communities and industry sectors that have been disproportionately affected by the impact of COVID-19. Mr President, over $600 million has already been committed, supporting industries including aviation, agriculture, fisheries, tourism and the arts. And these include support for regional aviation under our $100 million regional airlines funding assistance, relief for federally managed fisheries through the waiving of nearly $10 million in levies. Mr President, the Liberal National Government. We understand the impact of these occurrences on rural and regional Australia, and we will continue Order. to Senator support Cash. them. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Why is the government making older Australians wait twice as long for their bills, for cards from their grandchildren, and for letters from their doctors at a time when COVID makes the post an even more essential service? and lifeline for older Australians. The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Mr President. And the, and the opposition might like to cheer a little bit. They could have asked a question about Australia Post of the Minister representing the Minister for Communications. It, it, it might have been a good, guy, good idea, Order. Mr President. So, but I, but I order. am, Mr. President, Senator, I am Senator, happy to provide. Order. I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Well, point of order. We did and think that perhaps the Minister for Seniors might actually want to be, be interested Wong, in the experience of Senator Wong, with respect, that's not a point of order. Senator Wong, that's a point of debate. That's not a point of order. Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and, and the, Mor the, the Morrison government, Mr. President, is helping Australia Post provide Australians with important services. During, well, Mr. President, um, last time I looked to uh, to the uh, one of the consistent interjectors in the place older older Australians are Australians. Last time I had a look, and so uh, when we're assisting assisting senior uh, assisting Australians, we're also assisting senior Australians. Uh, by helping Australia Post to provide Australians with the important services they need during um, COVID-19. Uh, and Mr President, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has intensified 
a number of existing trends, with letter volumes declining and parcel volumes jumping. Parcel volumes are up 64 per cent in April year on year and letter volumes down 36 per cent year on year. 200,000 new households are shopping online. In response to Australia Post's request, Mr. President, the, the government has temporarily adjusted elements of the Australian Postal Corporation Performance Standard Regulations 2019. Order. Senator Kitching on a point of order. My point of order is relevance, Mr. President. I might, the question there was not a there was not a preamble. The question was why is the government making older Australians wait twice as long? when the post during a pandemic the post becomes a more essential service. I, I, was hearing, I was hearing Senator Colbeck address Australia Post directly in that part of the answer. Um, I will listen carefully, but I believe, that's, I believe that's relevant to the question if he was addressing the matter of Australia Post, but I'll listen exceptionally carefully. Senator Colbeck? Th th thank you, Mr President. Um, and these changes uh, uh, temporary and, and effective until the 30th of June 2021, and will be reviewed before the end of, end of the year. This flexibility, Mr. President, to retrain and deploy its workforce um, to support parcel delivery. Around 600 new roles have been uh, created to assist pa Australia Post to Order. meet the increased demand Order. for parcel delivery. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Feveranti Wells has raised concerns that the government did not consult with Australia Post employees or people who use the service. What efforts did this minister make to consult with older Australians about the government's proposed changes to service requirements? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, um, th this government has worked assiduously over recent months to assist all Australians to deal with the global health pandemic, which is COVID-19. And, and, and a, a range of measures have been introduced, including, including working with Australia Post to ensure that Australia Post can manage the increased demand that is required um, as, a change of, as a result of change in Australians' habits through being Order. Senator Colbeck. Senator Wong on a point of order. Direct relevance. We actually asked this minister about his engagement. What consultation, as the minister responsible for senior Australians, did he engage in uh, uh, as, uh, about the proposed changes to service arrangements? Um, on, on the point of order, um, Senator Wong, Wong raises a legitimate point about direct relevance in this case. However, I will be slightly broader in my interpretation of it, because that was the second part of the question. The first part did refer to consultation more generally. To be directly relevant, it is my view that uh, a minister could be directly relevant while talking about consultation about this change, not just that part of the question. But direct relevance is tighter than broadly the old definition of broad relevance. So I call Senator Colbeck to continue with that in mind. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I, and I, can I just reject the, 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 the core basis of the allegation that uh, the opposition is making about that we're trying to make people wait longer for the services they're receiving? We've done no such thing at any point. In fact, this government, all through the period of the COVID-19 outbreak, has done everything it can to accommodate changes that have occurred, accommodate the changes that have had to have been made because of the incidents Order, of COVID-19. Senator, Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. It is estimated that the government's plans will put one in four Australia Post jobs in limbo, many in the regions. Why is the government threatening the livelihoods of thousands of Australians during Australia's first recession in 29 years? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, can I again reject um, the assertions made in the question? Uh, in, in, in the question from Senator Kitching with respect to uh, the government's actions. The government has been working to facilitate changes that have occurred in the economy as a result of the COVID-19 pan uh, pandemic. It's put some temporary measures in place with respect to Australia Post to assist it to meet increased demand for parcels, uh, measures that will be reviewed uh, at an appropriate period of time. So, Senator, uh, Mr President, the Labor Party can scaremonger all they like. We have done no such thing 
as try and make people wait longer for their parcels. We've tried to accommodate the system to, to cater for the fact that there's increased demand because of people being isolating during COVID-19. So I reject any assertions from the opposition that they might make that we've been doing anything other than trying to assist Australians manage their way through the COVID-19 outbreak. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. Today it's reported that five of the six COVID commissioners that are advising how to rebuild after the pandemic have refused to make public their declarations about conflicts of interest. But the members of the Manufacturing Task Force of the COVID Commission don't even have to disclose their conflicts of interest, even to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And yet one of the members, James Fazzino, is not only a director of APA Group, but holds around $350,000 worth of their shares. That company will build the pipeline to the Narrabri gas fields. And guess what? The task force strongly recommends that that very gas pipeline be supported by government. Will the Prime Minister now require the financial interests of all task force members to be disclosed? Or do you not even care anymore about how in the pocket of the coal, oil and gas industry the government is? The Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I completely reject uh, that final uh, assertion, uh, which, is, which is wrong and which is offensive. Um, uh, furthermore, uh, the, uh, members of the, national, uh, the members of the National um, COVID Coordination Commission are distinguished Australians, and the Prime Minister expects them, of course, to manage, to manage any conflicts appropriately, and we're very confident uh, that they will. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, President. Firefighters with decades of experience working around the Narrabri coal seam gas site in the Pilliga Forest are terrified of the increased fire risk from gas flaring, particularly as climate change dries the surrounding bush, while farmers are terrified of the 850 wells that threaten their water supplies in the Great Artesian Basin. Will you listen to them or to Santos, because they've donated uh, more than half a million dollars to the Liberal and National parties? Okay. Um, Senator Waters, um, partly because of the almost disorderly imputation towards the end, I'm going to give the minister an opportunity to respond to, to that claim you made, but that is outside what I would interpret to be a supplementary question of a traditional nature, because I couldn't hear of a particular link to, of it to the first question. But I'm going to give the minister um, an opportunity to respond, given the claim you made and the assertion you made at the end. Uh, well, again, and you know, we get used to these sorts of um, outrageous statements uh, from that corner of the chamber, sadly, in more recent times. Uh, I miss Senator Di Natale uh, being in that front chair, I've got to say. But uh, let, me, let me just, let me, having rejected the uh, offensive assertion at the end, uh, the, uh, the uh, supplementary question, which is not a supplementary question, is based on an assumption that we have made certain decisions which we haven't made in relation to uh, considerations which uh, either haven't been finalised or haven't been put forward even to government. Uh, so, I mean, you're getting way ahead of yourself, and in getting ahead of yourself, you are uh, being uh, incredibly inappropriate uh, in the way you are imputa uh, making imputation, imputations against the government. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Yes, thanks, President. This question is also about gas and donations. Um, greenhouse gas emissions from gas extraction have grown 73 per cent in the last five years. Over the same time, there have been three major bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef. Gas is toxic for our climate. Do you prioritise a handful of jobs for your donors or countless species and the 60,000 Queenslanders and Australians that rely on a healthy Great Barrier Reef for their livelihood. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I tell you what we prioritise. We prioritise the national interest. We in prioritise the public interest. We prioritise jobs. And we prioritise opportunity for Australians to get ahead. And you know what? We're doing so in a way that is uh, up absolutely committed to uh, strong environmental protection. A strong environmental standards, but we will ensure that we pursue environmental protections uh, in a way that is economically responsible. Because, and you know what? When it, you, 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 you are here, sort of now trying to say that gas is a terrible thing. Australian gas can help reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. By, in particular, in particular, when it displaces other uh, more uh, polluting uh, energy sources. I mean, this proposition somehow that we ought to demonise 
uh, any uh, form of uh, Australian uh, produced energy uh, uh, source. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You go to the next election demonizing uh, gas production when that's uh, one, one of our very important sectors in our economy, making a productive and positive contribution to environmental protection. You go right ahead. We'll go Order. with our set Senator of more Corman, balanced time policy. for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Minister, during your time as Finance Minister, you have referred specifically to $667 billion in government debt as being, amongst other things, unacceptable, unsustainable, a mess and a disaster. Minister, what is the amount of gross government debt today? Minister uh, representing thank, the Treasurer, thank, thank Senator Cormann. Thank you very Cormann. much, uh, uh, Mr President. And, and you are quite right. You are quite right. Uh, that is precisely uh, what I uh, have said in the past. And that is the trajectory that a disastrous Labor government put Australia on between 2007 and 2013. Because when we came into government, we inherited a rapidly deteriorating budget Order. position. Remember those 11 weeks between Labor's last budget and their last economic Order. update? Senator Cormann. Billion Senator, dollars Cormann. Senator Cormann. I, Senator Wong, I have Senator Gallagher on her feet with a point of order. The point of order is um, not only relevance but also um, understanding Order 73.4 that the answer should not be debated, um, Mr President. But the question was very straightforward. What is the amount of gross government debt today? Um, and the, 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 the preface, to be fair, Senator Gallagher, contained assertions about quotations made you used of the minister. He is allowed to directly address those and be directly relevant. Um, there is an opportunity to debate the sufficiency or otherwise of answers after question time. Senator Cormann. Uh, so, so order. We were actually we are tabling this afternoon an updated a statement on Australian government debt. Uh, and now, given the question has been asked, I'll table it now. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that. And, and here we are. Let me tell you, it is much less than it would have been if we hadn't fixed your budget mess. Order. It is much less than it would have Order been if we hadn't fixed your budget left. mess. Because you know what? And I mean, we right. are in the middle of a pandemic. Everyone Order. other than the Labour Party understands this. Yes, we've had to spend it, a lot of money in the last few months in order to support the economy, to support business, to support jobs, to support those Australians who lost their job. And there is a context to this. But Order. let me tell you, we went, we went into... Sorry, uh, sorry, Senator Keneally, I'm not, I, I, can I say something before I take your point of order? When I can't hear Senator Cormann about three metres from me, there's a serious problem with noise. So I'm going to call everyone to order on the matter of noise, and I'll call Senator Keneally on the point of order I assume she's about to raise. Thank you, Mr President. It is direct relevance. The minister uh, says he has the answer. He's unwilling to That's say it out loud That's not a point of order. That, to Senator the chamber, Keneally, please so resume your him. seat. Please resume your seat. I am not in a position to rule on the relevance or otherwise of an answer I was struggling to hear over my own voice and are probably 50 members of this chamber. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Debt is much less than it would have been if we had not fixed Labor's budget mess. I mean, the Labor Party Order. at the same time accuses us of cuts that are too, too hard. Then they say we should spend more on everything. And then, and, then they say, and then they complain that the debt is too high. Like, let me tell you, the debt is much lower than it would have been under your government. Order. Uh, and, Senator and is, Watt. Under, under our Senator government. Senator Watt in particular. We, we, have, we, have, we have reduced your unsustainable spending yeah. growth. When you, when you oppose us every step of the way, every step of the way, and Australia went into this pandemic in a stronger fiscal position as a result of the work we did, and the Australian people know it, which is why they voted against you at the last election. Order. Order. Senator Wong, Senator Gallagher, who's on her feet. Order on my right and my left. Ah, oh, well. Order. I'll call when I order. Senator Gallagher. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. For the benefit of senators, um, as the minister won't say it, I, I will say the number. It's six hundred and seventy-three point four billion dollars today. Order, Minister. Can you confirm that gross? Order. Sorry, Senator Gallagher. Please, it is your own colleagues, Senator Gallagher, that are preventing me hear your question, which will make it hard to rule on the likely points of order. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Minister, can you confirm that gross debt has increased by $393 billion on your watch 
and that a staggering $288 billion of this was incurred before the COVID-19 borrowings began. Senator Corbyn. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Oh, uh... I, I, can, I can confirm that debt continued to increase because of the spending growth trajectory that Labor had locked into legislation Order. when we came into government, when we came into government, and that Order. the debt grew by less as a result of the work that we did, as a result of the work we did. And I can also confirm that the Labor Party clearly has been living under a rock because, because they don't understand why we've been forced to spend as much as we have in recent times. And let me, let me ask the Labor Party, which, which, which programme do you think we should scrap? Job keeper or job seeker? Should we should we Order. cut the job seeker payments in half? Is that what you're suggesting? Because that is the, impl the implication of your question is that you don't want us to uh, spend the money we're Order. spending on supporting business, on supporting jobs, on supporting the economy. You are completely out of touch, and the Australian people know it. It's probably. We're about to prove, Senator Wong. We seem to be proving why we don't sit Fridays. Can I ask senators? Can I ask senators to at least take a breath? I am struggling to hear Senator Cormann's rather booming voice. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. As the finance minister, who has now delivered six budget deficits and more than doubled the debt, would you describe today's gross government debt figure as unacceptable, unsustainable, a mess, and a disaster? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, Mr. President. The Labor Party left a mess. We put the country on a stronger fiscal foundation trajectory for the future. Look, Senator, Senator Wong talked Watt. about spending. Let me tell you, spending as a share of GDP was heading way beyond. We, we brought spending as a share of GDP down to, below the long-term average. You were running it in ex, past 30 per cent as a share of, share of the economy, according to the intergenerational report. Let me tell you, the Labor Party position is completely inconsistent. They are arguing for more spending, fewer cuts, but somehow think that that is going to lead to less debt. Well, let me tell you, your positions of fewer cuts and higher spending would lead to higher debt. Like that is basic mathematics. And I know that that is not something that the Labor Party understood uh, in government. That is not something that the Labor Party understood in government, which is why when we came into government, we inherited a seriously, rapidly deteriorating uh, budget position. I mean, your revenue forecasts were based on absolute, like, I was going to say something rude. Uh, Order, Senator Cormann. Time for the answer has expired. Order. 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 Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr President. Order. My question is to the Finance Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Minister. The Treasurer approves 99.9 per cent of all acquisition proposals that are first considered by the Foreign Investment Review Board. On those rare occasions when the Treasurer says no to foreign investment, he must find the proposed investment would be contrary to the national interest. The current legal framework, which can stop foreign ownership of critical or essential Australian assets, does not include the ownership of surface or groundwater. As a result of unlimited amount of water can be foreign owned in Australia, at the end of 2018, the ATO reports 10 per cent of all water entitlements in Australia are in foreign hands. Minister, is there any percentage of foreign ownership of water that would cause the government to consider it contrary to the national interest? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson for that question. The first point I would make is that um, Australia does rely on foreign investment in order to uh, reach and meet uh, our uh, economic growth opportunities. Um, we are a capital uh, importer in order to develop our economy, and though it is important that uh, any foreign investment is not contrary to the national interest, and we've got a well-established framework in place to uh, review foreign investment review uh, proposals, uh, foreign investment proposals to ensure that they are not uh, contrary to the national interest. I mean that uh, scheme broadly has been in place since 1975. In more recent times, a number of reforms uh, have been announced in relation to this, fundamentally to, I guess, um, strengthen the level of scrutiny uh, in, in the context of relevant proposals coming forward. We've made some temporary adjustments in the context of the COVID-19 crisis to ensure that Australian businesses at this difficult uh, time were 
uh, protected from the threat of uh, you know, inappropriate uh, foreign takeovers at a time of uh, comparative um, weakness and challenge. Uh, but, and we've also recently made some very significant reform announcements in relation to uh, national security uh, sensitive uh, businesses. And uh, critical infrastructure is, um, of course, one of the uh, areas also that we've put some uh, additional safeguards and uh, powers for the Treasurer uh, uh, in, 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 into, this, into this framework. Uh, I don't believe it would be useful to uh, provide arbitrary targets around, uh, you know, what uh, would be or, or would not be a desirable level of foreign investment in relation to a particular asset class. I think we've got to determine on whether or not there is uh, a, on whether there is a um, particular um, uh, reason why a, a particular investment would be contrary to the national interest. And, and ultimately, there is a high level of discretion for the Treasurer to make relevant judgments in this place. But let me just conclude on, on this point. Foreign investment is very important for our future economic growth uh, and success and for the opportunity. Order, Senator Cormann. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you. In 2014-15, DFAT and the ABS compared major, majority foreign-owned business with Australian business and found over 50 per cent of wholesale businesses, 40 per cent of manufacturing, 36 per cent of mining, 25 per cent of electricity, gas, water and waste services in Australia are foreign-owned. Is there any level of foreign ownership contrary to the national interest in any essential industry or service that would concern this, this government? And if so, what percentage would that Order, be? Order, Senator Hanson. Senator. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Look, I I'm not aware of the uh, sources of the data that Senator Hanson is uh, um, quoting there. I'm happy to. Uh, review and engage in a conversation in relation to these matters. What I, what I would say is that foreign investment uh, contributing uh, to the growth of businesses uh, around Australia and the growth of jobs around Australia uh, is something that uh, helps provide uh, increased opportunity for Australians to get ahead, for Australians uh, to um, uh, get a job, get a better job, pursue a career, uh, and that is something that is very much in our national interest. Senator Hanson, final supplementary question. Thank you. On 1 January 2020, China introduced its foreign investment law based on a negative list of industries, provinces and cities where no foreign investment is permitted. Where foreign investment is permitted, a Chinese company must have a controlling interest. Will the government introduce a similar approach for the Chinese investment in Australia? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. That is not something that we're considering. I mean, we've uh, recently uh, announced the uh, you know, most substantial reforms to our foreign investment uh, review arrangements in about you know, in nearly 50 years. Uh, you know, we, we do think it's important for us to continue to facilitate um, foreign investment into uh, Australia as long as it's not contrary to the national interest. And we do believe that the framework that we have in place has stood Australia in uh, good stead. Senator Fawcett. Order. Senator Fawcett. Thanks, Mr. President. Senator My question is for Senator Reynolds, the Minister for Defence. Minister, could you outline to the Senate the importance to Australia's national security of a submarine capability, and in that context, the importance of Project C-1000, the future submarine? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Fawcett, one for the question and two for your enduring passion and commitment to this important capability for our nation. The first responsibility of any Australian government is to keep Australia and Australians safe. That's why the Morrison government is investing over $200 billion to deliver the modern defence force our nation needs. This government recognises that the security dynamics in our region are deteriorating and we must invest in Australia's naval capability to address these challenges. Highly capable maritime forces are vital to our defence strategy, and none more so than from submarines. By 2035, we estimate that we will have over 300 submarines operating in our region. And as a maritime nation, our future prosperity depends on a stable rules-based order and the free flow of goods and services across our region through international sea lines of communication. This government's Australian naval shipbuilding enterprise is unprecedented in both scale and ambition. In Australia, we are simultaneously building five separate classes of new vessels, including highly complex submarines and frigates. In total, we have commissioned 63 Australian-built 
naval vessels. Six have already been delivered and nine more are currently under construction. For the Hunter-class anti-submarine warfare frigates and the Arafura-class offshore patrol vessels, we have adopted ambitious but deliverable schedules for design and for construction. Not only is this, has this saved Australian jobs, but is also creating many thousands more for many decades to come. All Australians have so much to be proud of in this truly national endeavour, and it is time to talk up our nation's achievements and not Order. undermine Senator them. Reynolds. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Minister, could you outline the steps the government is taking to keep Project C-1000 on schedule? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Senator Fawcett, and thank you, uh, Mr President. The 2016 Defence White Paper stated that the future submarines would likely enter service from the early 2030s. And let me make it very clear to everybody in this chamber and to all Australians that the future submarine program is on track to meet this time frame. Our current Collin class submarines are a highly capable and potent national asset. They are halfway through their life and are being constantly upgraded right here in Australia to ensure that they remain regionally superior until the introduction of the attack class submarine in the early 2030s. The competitive evaluation process that was completed in 2016 allowed this government to make a fully informed decision to build 12 new regionally superior submarines in Australia. Because that process found that there were no military off the shelf submarines internationally that met our very unique requirements. And can I say again, this is being delivered on track and on time. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Minister, could you outline to the Senate the steps that the government is taking to keep Project C1000 on budget? Senator Reynolds. Thank you uh, again, Mr. President. Again, can I be very, very clear about this project to all in this chamber? There is no blowout to the cost of the future submarine project. There is no cost blowout to the future submarine project. When we announced the program in April 2016, the estimated cost for acquisition in 2016 dollars was $50 billion. There has been no change to this cost in constant dollar terms. The future submarine program will run well into the 2050s, and the use of constant dollars allows for a consistent comparison of purchasing power over the life of the project. The deliberate conflation by labour of constant costs with outturn costs, which take into account inflation and exchange rate, is incredibly misleading and incredibly disappointing for a great Australian project. To put this very simply, Comparing constant and outturn dollars does Order. not represent a cost Time increase. Has expired. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Minister, I refer you to the ongoing situation at Kangaroo Point in Brisbane, where your government is trying to force refugees and people seeking asylum from the so-called alternative place of detention into an actual immigration detention facility. I've spoken personally to one of your innocent prisoners who was told directly he was being forcibly moved because he has spoken out publicly about the injustices he's faced over the last nearly seven years. Is it true that you are specifically moving people who've spoken out in the media or who have otherwise protested against their detention in order to silence their dissent? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and uh, I would thank Senator McKim for the question, but unfortunately the entire premise of the question uh, was untrue, so it's difficult to do that. Uh, so I completely reject, uh, Senator McKim, the premise of your question, and the answer is quite clearly no. Um, can I also point out in relation to the Kangaroo Point alternative place of detention, uh, because Senator McKim, you frequently refer to these places um, as places in which prisoners are held. The Kangaroo Point alternative place of detention is actually, for the benefit uh, of those uh, listening in, the Kangaroo Point Central Hotel and Apartments. That is the place 
uh, that you are actually referring to. And in relation to the protest uh, that is being currently held at the Kangaroo Order. Point Central Hotel and Order. Apartments, otherwise the Kangaroo Point Alternative Place of Detention. Can I just advise Order. for the benefit I'm struggling of to hear the, the Minister. Chamber that uh, Mr. President, decisions to move detainees between these facilities are made independently by the Australian Border Force. And as Senator McKim would know, these decisions are made for a number of reasons, including to manage numbers in each facility, for health reasons, and to ensure the safety of detainees, staff and the public. There are protests outside the Brisbane facility. Now, for the benefit again of Senator McKim, the man at the centre of these protests, oh goodness gracious, is Brisbane Greens councillor Jonathan Sree. Mr President, for the record, Mr Sree or Brisbane Greens councillor Jonathan Sree's actions are completely, totally and utterly unacceptable for a public official. And I would hope that Senator McKim would agree. Senator McKim, order on my right. Senator McKim on a supplementary question. Well, uh, thank you, President. I congratulate Mr Shree for his uh, recent actions and his outstanding results in, uh, in recent elections, I might add. Minister, Minister, how is Home Affairs deciding who to move? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, if Senator McKinn had listened, which clearly he didn't, uh, to my first answer, he would have heard me say decisions to move det detainees are made independently by the Australian Border Force. But let me order. just— uh, Senator, I've got Senator McKim on a port of order. Senator uh, McKim. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Port of order is uh, relevant. What we got is a generic answer to an absolutely specific question in regards to the actual circumstances that are pertaining right now Sen as we debate this matter. Senator the question is, how has Home Affairs decided who to move um, specifically so I, in I, regards I, the, to this situation? The second part of your question I have written down is, how is Home Affairs deciding who to move? That followed a preamble that you're responding to the minister's previous um, conclusion, concluding comments. Now, the minister can, was speaking for 10 seconds and had uttered one sentence. Um, it did actually that sentence did actually refer to the movement of people. I can't make a ruling on direct relevance. I cannot make a ruling on direct relevance 11 seconds in and one sentence in. I can't instruct a minister how to answer a question, but I do remind senators that ministers can be directly relevant responding to preambles as well as questions. Senator Cash. Thank you. And I would like now to address uh, Senator McKim's preamble, because in that preamble he actually congratulated Greens councillor Jonathan Sree. Well, let me tell the chamber what Greens councillor Jonathan Sree has been doing. Uh, what he is doing is inciting a protest whereby people are jumping on vehicles and a delivery driver was confronted by protesters who insisted on searching his vehicle. Protesters, and I again note the congratulations of Senator McKim, are also breaching colleagues' social distancing restrictions. Now, what is that doing? What is that doing? Risking the spread of COVID-19, not only amongst the community, Senator McKim, but amongst the people that you are allegedly standing here and expressing fake concern. Order, Senator for. Cash. Time has expired, Senator. McKim, I believe, has a further supplementary. I, I do, President. Yeah. Thank you. And I will put this with zero preamble. Minister, how has Home Affairs decided exactly who to move from Kangaroo Point to Baita? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And again, Senator McKim, I will repeat uh, the answer to both the primary question to the first supplementary, which is now the same for the second supplementary. Order. Senator McKim. On a point of order? Yes, again, President. The point of order is relevance. This is farcical. Um, my question was very specific, and a generic answer does not answer the question and ought not be considered relevant to the question. Well, uh, what, what ought or may not be considered relevant is um, 
uh, the rules are set by the Senate. Now, the Senate minister was alluding to a comment that the minister was about to make. The minister has to be strictly and directly relevant to what you raised, which was a very specific question. But my, I do not have the ability to instruct a minister how to answer the question. There is an opportunity after question time to debate it. But it was a specific question, and I will constrain the minister's comments to be directly relevant to the terms and the question you asked. Senator Cash. And as I stated, decisions to move data detainees between facilities are made independently by the Australian Border Force. Senator McKim. Order once again. That is an irrelevant response, Senator, Minister, uh, well, President. Not relevant to the question. Well, no, no, asked. Senator McKim. Firstly, the minister has no. concluded her answer, so I can't take a point of order. Secondly, I do not believe that answer, despite the fact that you consider it to be unsatisfactory, is not directly relevant because it goes to the movement of people. You are asking for the content of an answer. You can debate that answer, but I cannot instruct the minister that that statement is not directly relevant. There's a time to debate it and that is for others to judge. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Drought, Agriculture and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Yesterday, the government announced that it was committing $11.5 million to mental health support for emergency services workers who were impacted by the recent devastating bushfire season. Yesterday's announcement was in fact just a re-announcement from the $16 million in mental health funding the government announced in January. Why has the government's mental health support for emergency services workers to date been two press releases and not a single dollar spent? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, mm. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much uh, uh, to the Senator for his question and his ongoing interest in the bushfire recovery. Uh, and helping our bushfire affected communities across uh, Australia, which I can say that the, uh, the federal government, the coalition government, the Morrison government uh, is absolutely committed to helping uh, Australians that have been impacted by the bushfire, and which is why we continue to invest money in this recovery. And we also acknowledge, as, uh, as you do um, as well, Senator, that uh, the bushfires in 2019 20 have taken a very serious toll on the mental health of. Of Australians, um, it's taken a very traumatic emotional toll on those people that were infected in those communities. Uh, I know uh, firsthand from the communities that I have had uh, involvement with in South Australia uh, that it was a very tragic and terrifying time, and the impact lingers on, exacerbated even further by the fact uh, that they have now had to contend with the implications and the consequences uh, of the uh, the actions that have had to be taken around uh, the coronavirus um, pandemic. The government has committed over $100 million in mental health supports for emergency personnel, for individuals and communities impacted by the Black Summer bushfires. Uh, these include $76 million for a bushfire recovery mental health package announced on 12 January this year. and That package included free access to counselling in bushfire affected areas, Medicare rebated psych uh, psychological support, including via telehealth, which is particularly relevant given the COVID crisis, money for primary health networks for additional services and to administer grants into local communities, and specific support for emergency service workers and their families. In response to the need for more community-based support, the government has since announced an additional $13.5 million uh, for primary, um, primary care. Uh, into the primary health networks, and this is very, very specific. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator, what a supplementary question? Can the minister confirm that yesterday's $11.5 million announcement represents a $4.5 million cut to the $16 million already announced for mental health support for the same emergency services workers? Senator Rustin. Uh, well, in direct answer to your question, no, I can't, Senator. What? Uh, and I'm not going to. But what I would say to this chamber, following the question that I received yesterday, is Senator Watt, you can be very, very loose with the facts. Very loose with the facts. Order. Yesterday you, you came in this place and you accused us of only providing um, uh, support, uh, and you, I think you quoted a, a number of 4 per cent of Australians living in bushfire affected communities have been able to access government support. What you failed to mention yesterday, Senator Watt, Order, Senator, I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Mr President, how is this directly relevant? 
Well, I don't, inter I don't have a habit of, in, as they do in the other place, of interrupting ministers' answers. I wait for senators to No, no, I, I'm, I'm posing the question. This is, if the minister wishes to make, she has plenty of opportunities as a minister. She wants to debate Senator Watt. I'm happy to stay and watch that. But if she could answer this question, not argue the, yesterday's question, which she was unable Order. to answer. Order. I'm pleased you found the your minister, brief since yesterday. The minister is entitled to challenge the assertions or assumptions in a question. I, I, if I could finish, the minister is entitled to challenge assertions or assumptions in the question that must remain directly relevant to the terms of the question. I'm listening quite carefully and I will continue to do so. The answer must pertain to the announcement and or challenging or addressing any other claims contained in the question. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I will draw the senator's attention to the first sentence that I uttered after he asked the question when I answered the uh, question. But if they don't like the idea that I come in here and actually suggest that I've got evidence that, that Senator Watt is somewhat loose with his facts, well, uh, I'm sorry about that. But we'll move on to the bushfire crisis that we're talking about at the moment. And in 1920, in absolute, the bushfire crisis has absolutely exemplified, absolutely exemplified. Order, Senator Rustin. Um, Senator, what a final supplementary order. Senator Rustin, Senator, Senator Rustin and Senator Wong, please. It's only 10 minutes to go, Senator Rustin and Senator Wong. Senator Cormann on a point of order. Like, interjections are disorderly and the worst corporate when it comes to constant and relentless interjecting and personal interjections as well is uh, the leader of the opposition. And I ask you to call it to order. I am, I, Now, I have said before that there is no one in this chamber with a halo when it comes to interjections, um, but I do ask that I, Senator Wong, please, while I'm ruling, Sen uh, order. There are there are there are common interjections across this end of the chamber that I can hear. They are all disorderly, and we'll continue question time with Senator Watt's question if they cease. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm happy to table the article that cites the 4% figure after question time. In January, Mr. Morrison promised that relief would be immediate. Why did the government go five months without spending a single dollar from the $16 million announced in January for mental health support for emergency services workers? Why is this government constantly prioritising marketing and re-announcements over the needs of people affected by the bushfires? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Well, I obviously I completely and utterly reject the premise of uh, the comments that, uh, that Senator Watt just said and that, that this government would be prioritising um, anything over what is tremendously important uh, about uh, dealing with the fallout and the impact on the mental health of Australians who have been impacted by bushfires is an outrageous comment. We are absolutely committed to supporting particularly our emergency service workers who spent many, many, many weeks uh, many more weeks than we've ever seen before out fighting fires, and the impact that on the, the mental health of those emergency workers, the po post-traumatic stress disorders, the mental illnesses, and sadly in some cases the suicides, is something that this government takes very, very seriously. And we remain absolutely committed to, to help these people over the longer term, over the longer term, um, to make sure that they have the support that they need. Well, Senator, Senator Watt, as you would well know. Order, Senator, Senator Wong. Sorry, sorry, Senator Cormann. I mean, I know it's Friday order. afternoon. I know it's Friday afternoon and everybody's perhaps getting a bit tired, but interjections are disorderly. And I ask you to uh, call on opposition senators to de desist interjecting. Interjections are always disorderly. Um, I make the plea as I have all afternoon. Senator Rustin, the time has expired. Um, Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister advise the Senate on how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting our region and how Australia is responding through our Partnership for Recovery strategy? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Askew for the question and for her interest in our uh, international affairs. Because we know the COVID-19 challenge uh, has brought uh, a range of difficulties to our region. Health systems and livelihoods have been put uh, seriously at risk. With our Pacific Island neighbours, together we acted decisively to contain the spread of the, virus, of the virus, and we stood together in our responses. 
We're working with partners in the Pacific Island Forum to support a Pacific humanitarian pathway to move essential humanitarian supplies and workers. I'll meet again next week with my counterparts in the Ministerial Action Group on implementation of the pathway. And I really appreciate the support of the Tuvalu Foreign Minister, Simon Coffey, and the PIF Secretary-General, Dame Meg Taylor, in our joint statement about the pathway on 1 June. Framing our response, as the senator said, we released Australia's new development strategy uh, as partnerships for recovery, focusing on the Pacific, Timor-Leste and Indonesia, and concentrating on three areas—health, stability and economic recovery. This entails a pivot of our development effort towards the immediate needs of partners in our region. Mr President, we're also making important contributions to the global response and to the recovery committing $352 million at the European Union Conference for Vaccines, Diagnostics and Treatment, and $300 million to Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, which was indeed recognised today by a motion in this chamber, and I acknowledge uh, the support of the chamber for that. How this region comes through this crisis matters to all of us. The growth, the stability, of the Indo-Pacific has provided the foundations for our own security and prosperity. And most importantly, we recognise that Australia can only do this with partners in partnership. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister advise how Australia's work with its Pacific and Southeast Asian partners specifically prioritises the region's economic recovery? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The pandemic is having a significant economic impact. The International Monetary Fund predicts growth in Pacific Island countries will be between zero and negative 12 per cent this year. For example, up to 70,000 tourism jobs are at risk in Fiji alone. In Southeast Asia, economic growth is stalling after five decades of rapid expansion. We're working closely with partners, with international financial institutions, to forge pathways to economic recovery by keeping markets and businesses functioning, avoiding government debt, debt, debt stress, and strengthening human capital and job creation. Also in Indonesia, for example, we're providing technical advice on economic stimulus and social protection measures. In the Pacific, we're delivering immediate financing support to strengthen our neighbours' capacities to provide essential services to their communities. Senator Askew, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on Australia's engagement with Pacific women through the challenges of COVID-19? Senator Payne. Uh, Mr President, on 29 May I was absolutely honoured to co-convene uh, a Pacific Women Leaders Webex forum with the Deputy Prime Minister of Samoa, Fiame Naomi Matafa, to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on women's health, economic security and personal safety. 30 Pacific parliamentary and civil service women leaders from 18 countries. An impressive meeting in anyone's terms. Agreed to work together to explore new ways to enhance the well-being of women and girls. Contributions canvassed economic impact, family concerns, women's safety, jobs, cultural issues, thought-provoking and vital for shared understanding of the challenges. Our Partnerships for Recovery strategy is underpinned by a focus on the most vulnerable and includes addressing gender-specific impacts of COVID-19. Australia stands with Pacific women at this time. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, the member for Leichhardt called for an extension of JobKeeper beyond September for far north Queensland. He said, and I quote, I'm confident it will happen. Has Mr Ench been given any commitment by the Prime Minister about extending JobKeeper in far north Queensland? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Corbyn. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. It sounds, it sounds like a copy and paste from a question yesterday. I mean, it's Friday afternoon. The Labor Party has run out of questions. The Labor Party has run out of questions. Rinse and repeat. Order. Senator Gallagher, Gallagher on a point of order. Yes, Mr President. My point of order is that if the Leader of the Opposition continues to uh, replace substance with volume, you may need to revisit the social distancing policy Order. in this chamber. Senator, Senator Cormann. 
I, I agree with uh, Senator Gallagher's observations of the leader, on the leader of the opposition. Absolutely, I, I endorse them. I endorse them. I fully endorse them. And I understand that there's a great friendship between those two Labour senators from the great state of South Australia. The great state of South Australia. Now, um, getting back to the question, if you ask the same question, then you get the same answer. Uh, Warren Ench, the member for Leichhardt, is an outstanding uh, member of Parliament. He does a great job, and the people in Leichhardt strongly support his efforts, standing up for his communities. But uh, let me reassure Senator um, Chisholm, because I know he's concerned, uh, we have not made uh, any such commitment. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, this morning, the member for Braddon was asked if we will see separate rates of unemployment benefit in different parts of the country. He answered, and I quote, it's being considered at the moment and we're not excluding anything. Has Mr Pearce been given any commitment by Mr Morrison about a higher rate of unemployment benefits for Northern Tasmania? Senator Corbyn. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the uh, member for Braddon, of course, is another outstanding Liberal representative uh, fighting hard for the people of Braddon, and of course that is why, uh, that is why they gave uh, him their confidence uh, at the last election. Let me, let me also say that, of course, the government is considering on how we can provide the appropriate levels of support to Australians in need as we go through this COVID-19 uh, impacted uh, crisis. A crisis impact on the economy. Uh, in, in relation to arrangements for job seeker and uh, job keeper in particular, uh, moving forward, uh, we will continue to provide uh, support, appropriate levels of support all around uh, the country, and we will transition out of the current elevated levels of support uh, in the right way at the appropriate time. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. On Tuesday, Senator Stoker criticised, and I quote, endless subsidies paid for using money borrowed from future generations. Has Senator Stoker been given any commitment by Mr Morrison about government debt levels? Senator, uh, th Thank you very much, Mr President. It's great to see that uh, Senator Chisholm goes through all these outstanding uh, Liberal members and senators. We've got a few more. We've got a few more. And uh, Senator Stoker is, of course, absolutely right. Uh, we should absolutely minimise the burdens on future generations. And the absolute commitment that Senator Stoker has from the government, and every Australian has from the government, is that debt will always be lower than it would have been under the Labour Party. Debt will always be lower under the Liberal Party and the National Parties than it would have been under the Labour Party. Because, because the Labor Party, they, they of course left behind a rapidly deteriorating budget position. They left behind ludicrous revenue assumptions, like $120 a ton for iron ore, uh, which meant that the revenue they assumed they would collect was way above anything that was ever going to be realistic. Which is of course why, and, and then of course they locked in spending growth that was, not, that was not affordable. We're and you know what there. happened? Order. We fixed Labor's budget mess, and we are in a better position today as a result of the work we did and the Australian. Order. People know it. They know that you can't Thank handle you, money. Thank you, Senator Corman. Senator and I Corman. Ask further questions. Be prepared to lose paper. Hey, can't do this on Fridays anymore. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Colbeck to the senator to the question asked by Senator Kitching. The question was asked to the Minister for uh, Older Australians and Seniors because of how many senior Australians rely on and depend on our postal service. In fact, all Australians have relied on posties to deliver essential items they've needed throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. There's been a parcel boom. People have turned online to, to online shopping and local providers. Now our posties, they endure all types of weather, difficult terrain, and it goes without saying, swooping magpies. We rely on our posties, and they work hard for us. We often, though, just expect that the work they do will continue on. But now the Morrison government is wanting to rip that away. Under the cover of the coronavirus crisis and during a recession, the Morrison government are ripping thousands of Australia Post jobs away. The regulations the Morrison government is wanting to impose will let Australia Post scale back services, slash jobs and cut wages. One in four jobs, gone. The livelihoods of thousands of Australians, gone. Income for their families during a recession, gone. Longer waits for mail and for parcels. These changes will hit regional Australia the hardest. 
People in regional Australia will be forced to wait even longer than they currently do for mail and for small parcels. In Queanbeyan alone, the Morrison government's regulation will slash the frequency of posty rounds by half. Mail delivery timeframes will blow out from three business days to seven business days. Now is not the time to be slashing jobs in regional Australia. Disgracefully, the government has tried to use the coronavirus pandemic as an excuse for these horrendous changes. The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians said the government was, quote, assisting Australians through the COVID-19 outbreak, but they're not, and they're certainly not assisting Australia's posties. The, regulations will make, the regulation making these changes was made by the government with no consultation. They did not speak with employees or employer, employee representatives. Imagine that. Making a change is going to cost one in four jobs, cut wages during a recession, not speaking to employees or to employee representatives. This is a cheap shot at the workers of Australia Post. You can't say that you're for all Australians and then cut one in four jobs at Australia Post. The boom in parcel delivery should be an opportunity to grow jobs, not to cut them. If parcel numbers are booming, then why is Australia Post talking about redundancies? Why won't the Prime Minister work with our posties to guarantee their jobs and their futures? Why do posties and staff at Australia Post storefronts from the cities to the suburbs, to the regions, still have to live with the uncertainty that their jobs might be ripped away from them during a recession? The Morrison government must guarantee the thousands of postie jobs in Australia and those that service our communities. I mean, for a Prime Minister who loves a slogan, the small parcel boom should be a job maker opportunity. Instead, Scott Morrison and these cuts to Australia Post, just going to show he's a job faker, not a job maker. Finally, the government has given no guarantees that the changes won't be made permanent following the coronavirus crisis. As we well know, Mr. Morrison says one thing, and yet he does another. You just can't trust this Prime Minister anymore. He said JobKeeper will last till September. Then he ripped it away from 120,000 early child care workers. He said robo-debt was lawful, but it turns out it wasn't. Yesterday, he apologized, something the leader of the government in this chamber has yet to do. He said, the Prime Minister said he'd stop the boats. Then he let in the Ruby Princess, the one boat that mattered, that led to the biggest spike in coronavirus cases in Australia, an outbreak in northwest Tasmania. Now, the Prime Minister says that these changes to Australia Post are temporary. But how do we know that we can trust him when he says that? How do the people of regional Australia know that they can trust this Prime Minister? when he says that these changes are temporary, that their waits, the doubling of the wait time for mail and small parcels is going to affect people in Queanbeyan and in Cooma, in Jindabyne and in Marimbula. You used to be able to trust this government to make sure the post worked, that you'd get your mail, but you just can't trust them anymore. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Your time has expired. Senator Ripetts. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. This is a clear example of what the Labor Party gets up to. And I thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for her contribution, because it exposes the falsehoods that are always spun into their narrative. And I would invite the Deputy Leader to actually listen to what the CEO of Australia Post, one Ms Holgate, has had to say, and I quote, Unfortunately, there has been a range of <coughs> false claims, such as Senator Keneally's, that have been made about temporary changes to our regulations. We are not forcing our valued posties into redundancies. Unequivocal statement from the CEO of Australia Post, and yet a senior member of the Australian Labor Party seeks to assert the exact opposite. A complete falsehood, no fact. No substantiation offered, whereas we on the government side are able to show the support and substantiation from the CEO of Australia Post, keeping in mind that Australia Post is a government business enterprise in which the government of the day cannot interfere. And if I recall correctly, 
That was a change made to Australia Post by none other than the then Labor Minister for Communications, one Mr Kim Beasley. So that was a Labor change that does not allow government to make those sort of uh, um, interferences. And then another statement from the CEO of Australia Post. Union claims as many as one in four postie jobs will be impacted are false. But who made that claim? Senator Keneally, right in here, made that false claim. Why? Because her union bosses told her to do so. Yet we now know completely and utterly false. And so if Senator Keneally wants to practice what she preaches at us, she will be coming in here to apologise for misleading the Senate, either knowingly or unwittingly, her choice, but clearly a falsehood and a misleading of the Senate. What is more, Senator Keneally made the false assertion that there was no consultation with the union movement. Yet the CEO of Australia Post says, we continue to extensively consult with the union on issues and challenges COVID-19 has presented. So we either believe Senator Keneally or we believe Ms Holgate, the CEO of Australia Post. There is, unfortunately, a developing consistency about <coughs> Senator Keneally's contributions in this place and in the public space, and that is that you can't rely on what she says. It is a spin, and a spin that is not based on truth, a spin that is not based on evidence, but it is a spin designed to help the Australian Labor Party's ever flagging political fortunes. And what did Senator Keneally spin into her narrative? A number of townships around the electorate of Eden Monero. So what are they doing? The ALP very transparently peddling falsehoods like they did with Medi-Scare in 2016, have a false narrative put out into the electorate in a desperate attempt to win votes. They cannot win votes on their own merit, because if they saw to, you just had to listen to question time today. The first question from Senator Gallagher, what was that about? The ever-increasing debt. About two or three questions later, the question was about the government not spending enough. So we get condemned for an increased debt, then we get uh, attacked for not spending enough. The narrative completely and utterly inconsistent, and that is why the Australian Labor Party so consistently leaves the Australian economy in a mess, and when it does so, it means that Australians lose their jobs. And that is why the economic management of, the, of this country is so fundamental. That is why it's so important that people seeking to offer themselves to public life understand the importance of the economy, and we on this side do. Senator Keneally and the Labor Party today have displayed and disclosed that they do not understand it. I would invite Senator Keneally to be honest and put into the Hansard record Thank you, Senator Ms Abetz. Holgate's statements. Senator Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to take note of the question today on the question of postal services. And it's not for the first time we see that this uh, pandemic has provided this government with an opportunity to use the threat of this plague to pursue a covert and insidious policy agenda. And in this case, we'll see the government has used to, this uh, crisis to allow it to close many of our postal outlets and cutting essential services and putting more Australians out of work. And we have to remember that the services that the, that the Australia Post provides is not just about delivering parcels from the latest uh, purchases on the internet, it's about the provision of essential services like the carriage of medicines. Now these changes, of course, have been done without consultation with the relevant stakeholders, with the, either the staff or customers. They were introduced with exemptions provided by the Prime Minister on the 18th of March and they'll be under the regulations where a complete regulatory impact statement was not needed, was not provided. 
and didn't deliver to the union and then provided by the management as a basis for full implementation, not on the basis of temporary operation but on the basis of permanent operation. And subsequent amendments to these regulations will effectively allow for the closure of post office outlets throughout regional Australia. Now, at present, the Australia Post is required to maintain at least 4,000 retail outlets in defined areas. At least 50 per cent of those outlets have to be not less than, uh, in fact, have to be provided in cities, and about two, uh, sorry, 2,500 have to be provided in rural outlets. In the metropolitan areas, they must be located so at least 90 per cent of the population must be within two and a half kilometres of such an outlet. In metropolitan areas, 85 per cent of residents must be within seven and a half kilometres of an outlet. These regulations change that formula. Because under these circumstances, if the management determines that they have the discretion to close post offices. And what's the evidence for that? In the explanatory memorandum, read the explanatory memorandum. The explanatory memorandum says that on these staffing applications, the new regulations state that in all types of retail outlets, workers of retail outlets are to be interpreted broadly. Now, this is the concern that we've adopted through the uh, scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee, a bipartisan committee, where we see both the opposition and the government senators have written to the minister asking for an explanation for why these discrepancies have occurred and why it is that these, there should be a deterioration in service provision for the Australian people for an essential service like Australia Post. What we look to is the explanatory memorandum for evidence of what the government's doing. And I urge senators to actually read these documents before you cast judgment. Read the actual documents that Australia Post itself has put out on behalf of the government. These changes will reduce letter delivery standards. Priority mail services are to be suspended. The maximum delivery time for, for mail within one state is to increase from the day of posting plus five business days. Delivery frequency in metropolitan areas will be decreased from daily delivery to alternate business day delivery. The government, of course, has provided no attempt to consult with the union about the job losses that will inevitably flow from this. We know that the sale of assets has already begun. We know that, of course, what we're seeing that the job losses in up to 2,500 job losses are predicted. That does not include the job losses in mail rooms that support Australia Post. Now, the government pretends it's about defending rural interests. And of course, it does not go anywhere near the consequences of the reduction of services in rural to rural communities like that that's provided by Australia Post. Australia Post remains a trusted and valued public institution. We cannot afford to allow it to be fattened up for the privatisation like this government has done in so many other areas. We have to be careful of the consequences of the loss of public trust to valuable institutions like Australia Post. What we know is that the revenue of Australia Post for its parcel service delivery is actually growing dramatically. I don't want to see Amazon or any other organisation of that type take over what is, should be the proper function of a public institution, an essential public service Thank you, like Senator Australia Carr, Post. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Well, it is a very exciting day when you hear the Labor Party rediscover regional Australia because regional Australians know that they completely forgot about them going into the last election. In fact, I was absolutely delighted to discover that Senator Keneally thinks that Queanbeyan is the heart of regional Australia. And I do need to let her know that as a regional Australian, as a regional Queenslander, being in Queanbeyan does not mean that you are way out in the sticks. But it is great to know that the Labor Party has rediscovered this essential part of the country. And uh, Senator Carr has continued with that, uh, with that discovery. Again, an exciting day for Australia to have the Labor Party uh, remember that they exist. Um, it is always disturbing to hear the Labor Party start talking about facts because they're generally very short on them. And today's facts are a 
hodgepodge of made-up numbers and scare campaigns, uh, and they've absolutely not read uh, the reality of what is going on for Australia, both regional and urban, as a result of COVID-19. And in addition to that, the changing consumer habits, uh, which is relying more and more on online shopping and postal deliveries, uh, parcel deliveries. In fact, parcel volumes are up 64 per cent in April year on year this year, and letter volumes down 36 per cent in May year on year. I'm sure that Senator Keneally and Senator Carr can both remember the happy days of receiving a handwritten letter in your letterbox, of the joy of tearing open the mail to see what exciting news you've received from far away, maybe even from regional Australia. Uh, but that is, of course, a thing of the past these days, and it is less likely that you'll receive a card or a note handwritten in the mail. Uh, and indeed, even shopping. We have 200,000 new households shopping online for the first time in April this year. Uh, and whether it be um, uh, clothes or books or even food, uh, the delivery of all sorts of products to people's homes has changed the way we live completely because of the very necessary uh, restrictions on movements due to COVID this year. And so, in response to Australia Post requests, the government had to temporarily adjust some elements of the regulations to allow for Australia Post to deliver on these changed requirements uh, in this era of COVID. And it has given Australia Post flexibility to retrain and redeploy its workforce. Um, the Morrison government completely rejects Labor's misleading and baseless scare campaign around changes to Australia Post. These changes are not permanent. They are temporary and they are subject to review. There will be no forced redundancies or cuts to Postie's take-home pay. And delivery frequency in regional, rural and remote Australia will not change, and licensed post offices are actively supportive of these relief measures. And once again, I, I too um, am confused by Labor's mixed messages around, uh, in one moment they think the debt is too high and in the next moment they think it is too low. It is just another example of the confusion that Labor is in, and, uh, and the Labor Party and the Labor plan that was so unanimously rejected by regional Australians right across this country. Um, and I think uh, it's important to acknowledge the flexibility that Australia Post has been able to demonstrate during this time, particularly with their partnership with the Pharmaceutical Guild to deliver medicines to homes for vulnerable and isolating people. <coughs> this was available nationally. Uh, this was uh, a terrific, a terrific um, example of how modern practices were able to uh, change quickly to address the changing demands of Australians who, unlike other people in this chamber, followed medical advice. They stayed home. Uh, they they self-isolated and they got Australia through this terrible pandemic uh, by flattening the curve. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy, oh, Deputy President, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to respond to the non-answer, which is typical and uh, form uh, the form that we normally see Minister Colbeck uh, show in this place. And once again, he showed it today. I'd have to describe his response when he was asked to give his view about what was happening with Australia Post on behalf of the older Australians in the country who so predominantly rely on this particularly important essential service. Mr Colbeck's reaction was to be shocked that he should even be asked. He was asked if he had paid attention to his responsibilities as a minister to consult with older Australians. Surely if the minister had undertaken any consultation in any form whatsoever with older Australians about their views with regard to these changes to Australia Post, he would have been able to name off at least a couple of conversations that he'd had, at least a couple of consultations with um, leading senior um, advocates. However, 
His response reveals, through his non-answer, his shock and his failure to indicate any consultation at all, that Minister Colbeck has once again failed Australians who so predominantly rely on Australia Post to deliver vital information and, indeed, as Senator Carr has indicated, the vital service that's provided through Australia Post in delivering medication to older Australians right across this country. Um, Senator Colbeck wasn't the only one who, uh, who uh, S Senator Colbeck is not the only one who is absolutely responsible for making sure that older Australians are made aware of changes that will impact on their life. And in fact, there are many champions who do listen to the older community around this country. One of them uh, on his own team is Senator Fiavanti Wells, who raised herself concerns the government has acted in haste in delivering uh, regulatory reform without proper scrutiny that is going to make a significant change to the way that Australia Post operates. Now, we have heard all of the excuses under the sun from those opposite who have participated in this conversation uh, this afternoon, this debate this afternoon, uh, about why we should trust this government, that the, the changes that they are going to bring in are only temporary. But we cannot afford to trust this government. This is a government that just a couple of weeks ago misplaced $60 billion. This is the government that delivered robo-debt. And uh, the impact of that on hundreds and thousands of Australians is something that they should be absolutely ashamed of. This is the government that has proven over and over to Australians that it is completely untrustworthy. One of the critical things that we know from Australia Post right across this country, and particularly in regional Australia, is how central it is to every single community. The community that I live on on the Central Coast uh, has a, a very um, small post office uh, in the news agency, which is commonly the way these things are located, and it is a hub for the distribution of information around our community. The posties who operate out of these post offices across the country not only deliver very important mail and essential goods, such as pharmaceuticals, to Australians right across this nation, they also are part of the social fabric of the country. Just being able to move around the community, to deliver mail, to notice when mail isn't picked up, these are important ways in which the community is able to keep track of what's happening amongst the population uh, that is being served by each of those Australia Post offices. Senator Carr raised a very, very important point about the detail that is embedded in the explanatory memorandum that relates to the actions that are possible by, from this government with regard to Australia Post. The determination of Australia Post as an essential service makes it very, very different from other, uh, other entities around this country. Having a, a ratio of uh, Australia Post outlets not only provides security for the delivery of those uh, for, for the delivery of mail and also of parcels, it also provides an important distribution of an essential service. Uh, there are con serious considerations given by governments of both persuasions from time to time about how the network of Australia Post might provide additional services and access to government services. An assumption is often made by those who don't understand the true nature of access to internet in this country. Australians, not all Australians have access to internet services and uh, the sort of shopping that has been described in this debate this afternoon. People who don't have the internet are particularly vulnerable when it comes to interacting with the, part, with the, with the government and need the access to the proper service Thank delivery you, that Senator only Australia Post can has provide. Expired. The question is that the motion is moved by Senator Keneally to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the response by, Sen uh, by Senator Cash uh, to the question I asked her in question time this afternoon. Well, I asked Minister Cash about uh, the situation, which is still ongoing, where uh, a number of refugees and people seeking asylum have been imprisoned in a hotel in Kangaroo Point are being forcibly moved to immigration detention by the Department of Home Affairs. And this terrible circumstance highlights a number of issues. Firstly, how this government continues to find new ways to extend the utter despair of people who have now spent nearly seven years, most of it 
exiled on either Manus Island or Nauru, uh, where some still remain, uh, and others who are currently in Australia. And it's not only extending their despair, it's extending the terrible harm that it's caused to them and has already perpetrated on them for far too long. This is seven years of death, seven years of misery, seven years of arbitrary detention, seven years of arbitrary indefinite detention, seven years of deliberate harm being caused to innocent people. Ultimately, this is seven years of torture, and it is not acceptable for a liberal democracy like Australia to torture innocent people. And it ought not be acceptable for this chamber and this parliament to continue to support that torture. Now, the people in Kangaroo Point are people who have been evacuated to, to Australia because of urgent medical need. They were evacuated here under the Medivac legislation. And I spoke personally to one of the people the department was trying to move last night, and he was told directly he's being moved because he spoke out against his mistreatment. That's why they chose him. Yet Minister Cash rose in question time today and denied that obvious truth. Let's be clear about this. The government has picked out people who have spoken out about their mistreatment, who have hung banners from their hotel, and it is forcing them against their will into immigration detention centres. This is being done to silence their dissent and to prevent them from speaking out about the terrible injustices that our country has perpetrated on them. And if you had any doubt whether these people are political prisoners or not, that doubt should now be moved, because they are 100 per cent certainly political prisoners. This is the stuff of a totalitarian government, not how a government should behave in a so-called liberal democracy. Instead of locking them up, why not finally end their nearly seven years of torment and let them rebuild their lives in the Australian community as we have committed to do when we signed the protocol to the Refugee Convention? And if the government is not prepared to do that, why not finally accept the kind and generous offer from the New Zealand government to resettle these people over time so they can rebuild their lives in New Zealand? How much more do these innocent people need to suffer? How many more years are going to be stolen from them? How many more families are going to be torn apart? How many more children are going to be harmed? How many more lives are going to be broken by this policy? When will it finally be long enough to satisfy the Liberal, National and Labor parties in this place? I want to thank the brave people who protested against these moves in Brisbane last night and again today. They have shown far greater leadership far greater compassion and far greater humanity than the members of the Liberal, National and Labor parties in this place. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator McKim to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.